Welcome to this presentation on Jenkins for PHP. You will learn a damn thing about PHP this morning. Just kidding. Learning about how to use Jenkins for PHP projects. Um, before we get started, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Stefan Uchtöffer. If you really want to go pro, you can try to pronounce my last name, but you don't need to. Just call me Stefan. It's OK. I can live with that. Uh, this weird looking letter in my last name is an indicator that I'm from Germany. I live there. I run my own company there. The company is called BitExpert. We're in business for 12 years right now doing web and mobile stuff for our clients. Uh, my current role is head of technology, which means I'm kind of internal consultant for our project teams. And when I'm not doing that, I'm sta standing on stage and speaking about what we do and how we do things. If you do have any questions, feel free to ask. If you are offended by speaking to a German in public, it's OK. So this is my email address, this is my Twitter account, um, and we can have a private chat. OK, so that's about me. Who are you? Any one of you doing PHP? OK, quite a few. OK, so the others, um, I show a lot. I don't show any PHP code at all, so don't be scared about that one. So maybe you can still learn a thing or two. Um, before we get started, I want to give you a bit of context about my company. So we are mainly a technology company working for our clients, which means we use rather different technology stacks for all the different projects. Um, and within these different technology stacks, we also use different frameworks and whatnot, so pretty diverse in all of these things. And four years ago, we completely revamped our IT infrastructure and we introduced Jenkins um, just to help us cope with this really freaky situation we're in. Um, good. What, what are the use cases we use Jenkins for? Um, first of all, we power Jenkins, or we let Jenkins power our continuous build. So on every check-in, we do quote quality checks, unit tests, and, and stuff like that. Um, we do have set up nightly builds for some more complex tasks, um, compiling JavaScript applications, doing more, more other stuff, which I'll mention later on throughout this talk. And then we obviously run integration tests, so testing everything up to the database, um, service layer, or the whole front-end stuff. And last but not least, we use Jenkins to power our Cetus build. Um, Cetus is part of this Composer ecosystem. I guess you are all um, sure what that means. If not, I'll go into detail later on. <clears throat> Before I show you how we set up our Jenkins jobs, I thought it's a good idea to give you a general overview of how our Jenkins setup looks like. Um, and I'll start by showing this one. So this is the, the start page, and you see when you know Jenkins, you know there is this sidebar on the left side. I just ripped it off of all the screenshots just to give you more, more space for the other context information. So don't be confused if you don't see this left sidebar. Um, what I added recently are these icons you see on top and on the very right. Um, now, this is the custom uh, jobs icon plugin, which allows us to do that. And it just helps us a bit to get more information what a specific job is. So we have icons for the nightly builds, for the integration builds. Usually, the names of the jobs are more or less self-explanatory. But in other cases, it's not that. And so the icons help a bit to categorize um, what that job actually is. Um, if you've installed this plugin in the Jenkins configuration, uh, you can easily upload any kind of icon, and then um, you can use it in your jobs configuration. Just select the custom icon checkbox, and then pick the icon that you want, which is really nice. Another cool thing we added recently was um, we use the config file management plugin, which allows us to push configuration files from the Jenkins master down to each of the build nodes. Now, we use this for two specific cases. On the one hand, to push the composer.json file, which contains our GitHub OAuth token and some other configuration, as well as the .NET RC file, which is used by Git to do the local checkouts. So I did not need to whitelist all of our um, build nodes to be able to access our Git repository without any password and stuff like that. So that's pretty cool. I'll show you that uh, later on in the job configuration. <clears throat> now, these are just a few of the build nodes we are dealing with. Um, when we started using Jenkins four years ago, we just had a simple master-slave setup, and it grew into a lower two-digit count of, of build nodes. Um, all a bit different, different PHP versions, different operation systems different tools installed and whatnot, because as I said, we're dealing with quite different technology stacks. 
And we, um, we have actually two categories of build nodes. Um, the ones I call build node are usually used for unit tests and then code sniffer tests and such things. And we have um, integration test nodes which host the application that should be tested. So that's the, that's the uh, difference that we make in this case. Um, we do it that way because it was easier for us um, to have a dedicated node for the application where also the Jenkins slaves run on, so the files are pushed down and um, then checked on the same node. We don't need to copy files around, so that's pretty nice. Um, to get a node, you all have seen this, hopefully. Um, you give the node a name, a description, and um, what I found out recently is this labels feature, which is really cool. So um, usually when we define a node, we define the features that the node provides. Like in this case, I know this node has the PHP 5.6 installed, has uh, Sencha Command 4 and 5 installed, NPM, Papa 3.6, and HHVM. So we describe literally what's going on on this box so we have an understanding. And later in the job configurations, we use this label feature to figure out or let Jenkins figure out um, which nodes to let the build run on. We also define some environment variables um, so that the Jenkins build nodes are able to access our status repo because it's also password protected. Um, and we define it as environment variables and reuse that later on in the job configuration. <clears throat> so let's get started. How does a, a, a job for a continuous build look like in our infrastructure? <clears throat> but before that, I'll just outline. You probably know, know most of these, these tools. So we use Composer, obviously. Uh, we use Fing um, for, for uh, the build configurations. We use PHP unit, uh, yeah, code sniffer, pdpend, PHP CP and some others. And this is how a typical project structure looks like. Um, we have a build folder with all the thing files related to, to the build setup. Um, there is a master build XML file in the root folder. And um, yeah, that's it. So most of our projects look exactly like this. <clears throat> and this is how, how thing looks like. So when we started the company, I was a big fan of Ant. And we used Ant all over the place, up to the point I discovered thing which I call and on steroids for PHP. Um, so even if you don't know Fing, you're probably quite familiar with, with the look and feel when you know and. Um, we have a, a dedicated build file for our CI server. That's why the project is named CI. And our tasks also have a kind of CI prefix so that we know like these tasks are CI related and um, don't need to be called by our developers. And in this build task, we do a lot of stuff. We run all the tools that I just mentioned before, pdpen, php unit, uh, php cp, d, php md, and, and the code sniffer. And all these tools spit out the configuration or the log files that Jenkins is able to, um, to read and interpret. So this is how our, our job configuration looks like. Now, every job has a name. You guessed it, a description. Um, we try to name the jobs the same way we name our Git repo, so there's a strong connection with that. Um, so it's pretty clear what job relates to which project. And then um, comes the labels feature into play, which I just said a couple of slides before. Uh, when we started using Jenkins, um, I used to add the name of the build nodes where the job should run on in this uh, input field, which with two or three nodes was OK, because most of the nodes were configured the same back then. But as our nodes grew, it was quite complicated to keep track of which node does offer which features. And um, by accident, I coined the Jenkins law, which says, um, it doesn't matter how many build nodes you put in there, Jenkins will always pick the one which at least misses one tool and the build will fail. I'm not sure how good the, the AI of, of Jenkins is, but this happened all the time. That was pretty annoying. And I was thinking, how can I change that? And um, the answer is, we do it like this. We use the labels to express what features or functionality the build node needs to run this job on. Like in this case, I know the job needs a PHP 5 installation. Um, the, uh, the build needs npm installed, and the build needs the Sencha command 5 installed. And Jenkins will go out and figure out um, which of the build nodes provides all these features. And as you can see in the input field, below the input field, it says slaves and label one. So it 
shows me exactly how many slaves are relevant to this special configuration. So that's really cool. Um, saved me a lot of time and pain. Then next up, the environment configuration. Um, probably not, not really worth mentioning, but we use, or I like to use the color uh, NC console output, so it just makes things easier to read. And um, down below you see this is the mask password plugin which I'll refer later, and we enable that as well. Um, as it turns out, the way how we use Composer and do the password management, you could see the username and the password in the build logs, which is rather stupid, because I don't want my developers to see all these pretty important passwords. Um, and by accident, I come across this mask passwords plugin, which um, yeah, like masks or any kind of whitelisted letters, whatever, in the build output, so you can, can hide all this sensitive information. That's really cool. Um, yeah, and then the build starts. As I said, we use the, the config file provider plugin to download or to copy the configuration files from the server to the slaves. Like in this case, we copy the .NET RC file so that I don't need to provide any username and password when I do git checkouts. <clears throat> um, first and foremost, and this is also a lesson learned, um, we had a few projects or a few libraries that didn't have any dependencies. And so the, the Jenkins job was mainly used to trigger status, the status build. And I realized that when I edit JSON files, I really suck when it comes to editing JSON files because of trailing commas. I just add them all over the place. And so status would crash because it couldn't read the, the, the uh, composer.json file of the package. And again, I was pretty annoyed. I was looking how, how I could solve the situation. And the answer was pretty easy. Um, so the first step for all of our projects, for all of our jobs, is we validate the composer.json file. If it's not valid, the job will fail. So fail early, fail often. <clears throat> if we pass the step, we do install our dependencies. Um, I'm not sure if anyone of you is uh, familiar with the tool expect, which is a, a command line tool for, for Linux, which acts as a kind of remote control for, for other command line tools, so I can like, control the, the output and the interaction with the tools. And we use this to communicate with Composer, and when Composer requests username and password from us, we simply send the environment variables we de defined before. And in case Composer is asking for, for yes and no questions, we always answer with the yes, regardless of, of the output. Um, we typically don't need to do that anymore because there is, since one and a half years, there is a, a feature in Composer which is able to store the authentication information in a separate file. So we could also, I'll just skip back, you could also use um, the config file provider plugin to push these files to the slaves. But since we have some setups where we still use expect, um, I thought it's a good way just to keep the Jenkins jobs as they are. <clears throat> so that's how we do it. Next up is we run thing. We run the build. Um, we do install thing locally. So there is also a thing plugin for, for Jenkins, which at least at the time when I looked at it, required thing to be globally installed which is something that we don't do. We install every dependency locally. So I could not use the, the Fink plugin. And I had to use the, the simple shell uh, command stuff. So we simply call uh, vendor bing thing, point it to the build XML file, and call the CI build task, which then triggers uh, code sniffer, PHP unit, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> In case the project is a, a back-end, front-end project. Um, we use NPM for the front-end stuff, for, for JavaScript linting and so on. So we install the, the JavaScript dependencies via NPM. And then we do run NPM CI build as well, which spits out all the respective check style JUnit and one files. <clears throat> right. And then obviously we publish the, the results. Um, also, something that I didn't really know and I couldn't really find some documentation on, I just discovered it by accident, um, you can use wildcards when you define these files. Like we had the problem, uh, the PHP application would spit out like check style files and the JavaScript front end would spit out check style files. And I, would, I thought I would need to merge them before Jenkins can process them. 
So I wrote a, like a simple thing task which would do that. And then by accident, I figured out, hey, I can use the wildcards feature and just say, hey, there are files uh, with a prefix check style. Just take all of them and um, put them all together, analyze them, and whatnot. So that's pretty cool. And we use that for, for all the different files that, that we evaluate. <clears throat> right. And when the build is done, we, use, uh, we send out emails if, if everything was, was fine or not. So this is not the default Jenkins mail plugin. It's called mail-x or something, which was a bit, um, a bit easier to configure um, concerning our needs. So we simply send out an email to a mailing list, um, which is connected to the, the project. And um, for most projects, we simply say we send out an email just on the first failure and then on a success. For libraries or for nightly builds and continuous builds, um, we send out emails on every failure. So we just um, make that dependent on how important um, the build is for us. <clears throat> um, if we're dealing with a library, we want to make sure that it doesn't only run on PHP, but also on HHVM, like Facebook's PHP alternative, as well as on the soon-to-be-published PHP 7 version of PHP. So we simply say when, when the build um, worked on the, on the default PHP version that we are using, just trigger the, the other build projects for, for the respective platforms. <clears throat> When it comes to HHVM, that's also a lesson learned. Um, you should always understand what's going on. Um, before I figured out that I was completely doing something wrong, I just had like the line in the middle which says HHVM minus V and so on. Um, running and um, the builds were always working fine. I said, hey, that's cool. Our, our stuff just works on HHVM as it does on plain old PHP. And by accident sometimes, at one point, I, I run this HHVM stuff locally, and I figure out, damn, like, locally my tests are failing, but Jenkins says the tests are working. Um, so I rerun the tests manually in Jenkins, and I figure out, damn, Jenkins says everything's fine, something's <laughs> seriously wrong. And I analyze the situation, and the thing is, um, since we invoke thing, and thing will invoke PHP unit, thing run on HHVM, but PHP unit run on PHP. So I had to come up with a really dirty hack and workaround to, um, to work around that, that fact. So I exported, I, I set the workspace as part of the path parameter, and I added the sim link from HHVM to PHP. And so um, when thing starts executing PHP and via PHP, it does so using HHVM. And after that, I just clean up the sim link. That's really a stupid, annoying workaround, but it, yeah, pretty damn works. <clears throat> And again, if the project is a library, we'll trigger our status build. Um, in this case, it's a parameterized build, so we need to pass the name of the package as well as the recipients that will be notified after the build. I'll just cover that um, in a couple of slides. <clears throat> so nightly builds. As I said, for a lot of projects, we have set up nightly builds, which run, as the name implies, once a night. Um, in case of more JavaScript-ish projects, we build the application, which usually takes quite some time, and I don't want to do that for every commit. I just want to know like once a day if, if everything's up and, and fine. Um, in other cases, um, we figured out that we need to be aware of security issues. And as it turns out, the Sensu guys from, from the Symfony um, world have created a securities of advisories checker, which collects security advisories of all different PHP projects. And you can let them check your composer.log file um, against the database, and then it will tell you if you are affected or if your dependencies are affected of security issues or not. Um, they do have a FAR file which you can download, and then just call the security check task, point it to your composer log file, and then you get a nice, nice output stating how many packages um, are affected of vulnerabilities. Um, what we did is I wrote a thing task doing exactly the same, um, which you can simply hook into your, into your thing environment, and then uh, we use Jenkins in our nightly build just to also check or do this, 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 do this security check so we are aware of any security problems um, of our dependencies. 
So in this case, if the build fails, um, the job will fail and will we'll be notified via email. And then can ju just have a look. <clears throat> Great. Uh, integration tests. So as I said in the beginning, we do have special build nodes simply dedicated to integration tests because I didn't want to mess around with um, our build nodes, downloading all the, uh, all the doing the, the Git checkout and then pushing the files over to another box. Um, since all that stuff runs locally with our own internal network on two KVM boxes, I just didn't care and said, well, we have dedicated nodes just for the integration tests um, where the Git checkout will occur right on the box, and then the tests are run again, it's the, the same box. Um, for that, again, on the PHP side, we have an, an thing task for that, uh, build minus int, which then does just some more stuff, doing all the unit tests as well as the integration tests, testing the service layer back to the database back and forth. And um, if we deal with JavaScript, uh, we have exactly the same. In this case, we use Selenium um, to do all the front-end testing. So uh, the build node would connect to the Selenium host, well, the hub actually, uh, which then redirects to one of the Selenium nodes, which then connects back to the build, uh, um, build node itself, runs the test against it, and um, the output is written locally on the build node and then evaluated in Jenkins. <clears throat> Great. So last but least, status. Um, who of you is user of Composer? Okay, great. Um, sometimes it can be problematic or, yeah, problematic is probably the best word, um, to open source like code of your customer. Like in our case, we do work for customers, build a couple of applications for them, and then come up with like small libraries that interact with the environment of the customer. And it doesn't make any sense to open source that code because it's like just for the customer. I don't want to push that publicly. And with packages, the default source for, for the packages code is de facto public, right? So you could either use Satis or uh, Toron Proxy, which is, which is another tool, um, to create a local version of packages in your, uh, in your company environment. And that's what we did. Um, installing status is pretty easy. Uh, it's just a, a, a composer call. You say simply composer create project composer status and we'll just download all the files that are needed and then you're good to go. In addition to that, you need a configuration file. Uh, you need to give the status repo a name, a URL, and then just point it to the different repositories plus some configuration code. Now, interestingly, in our case, um, our Git repos, the status server, and the Jenkins master all run on the same host, which gives us the opportunity to define local URLs and at, when, when defining the repositories. I do, don't need to point it to an HTTP or SSH URL, um, which means that status will run a lot faster because like, all the files are already downloaded on disk and can be accessed directly. <clears throat> and then we simply run status. Um, we simply say set is build, uh, point it to the configuration file, and point it to the, to the folder where, where the files should be generated, and that's it. If you do pass a list of project names as, as the last parameter, only these projects or any, only these packages get re-indexed. It's not entirely true, but it's a lot faster this way if it runs locally. Um, so how we do, the, how we do this in, in Jenkins? We have a set is job which you guessed it is named Zetis. Um, we, as I said, the build is parameterized. We have a package as, as a first parameter. Um, so I'm able to run the Zetis build just for, for one specific package. Um, this is also a feature I hacked into Zetis because we had the issue one time that the, this whole Zetis build took like half an hour or so, like a couple of times did that happen. And again, that was really annoying to me. Um, because you push out this new version of the package and you want to use it like instantly and I don't want it to wait like 30 minutes or so. Um, so I came up with the idea of just re-indexing um, fixed packages. And there's also a feature I came up recently. Um, in the first place, we did not send out any emails. 
So the, the workflow for us was uh, we've committed a file, we pushed, pushed the stuff in our Git repo, then I opened the browser, uh, went to our status website, and pressed F5, 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 F5 till the new version would come up, which again is really annoying because you don't know how, how fast this, this build will run. So I thought, hey, it's a good idea to send out an email when everything's done. So in the first iteration, I simply send out an email to our whole company um, mailing address, which was the easiest way back then. And I thought, hey, it's a good idea because everybody in the company knows that there is a new package. As it turns out, we had one project where the guys were pretty keen on committing often and pushing often, which resulted in a shitload of fucking emails. <laughs> and uh, most people went crazy. So um, what I did is I, I limit the, um, the mailing address and just point it to specific users. And I can pass the email address when we run the status build. <clears throat> okay. So this is how, how we invoke status. As you've seen before, we pointed to our status instance. We call build. We pointed to our configuration file, uh, pointed to where to write the files, and then just um, yeah, use, the, um, use the variable, which is available or not. So again, if the variable is empty, status would re-index all the different packages. <clears throat> um, in addition to that, as I said, we run status and git and, and the Jenkins master on the same node. And in the configuration file, I had the local file URL, which means when I want to do a source checkout, it would not work because status in the configuration would have the lo local file URL, which you can't simply check out over network. So I just need to fumble a bit, do a bit of magic uh, using SED, and just replace our local file system URL with our HTTP or HTTPS address for our Git repo. And last not least, um, status generates a whole bunch of files and continuously changes them. Um, and so I thought at one time it's probably good just to clean up the old ones. So every file older than seven days will just be deleted from, from our server. <clears throat> and then again, as I said before, we love to send out emails. Uh, dollar recipient is, is the recipient address that came in when you configured or when you invoked the job. And dollar package, again, is, is also the variable I passed in. And so all our users um, get nice looking emails, pointing them to the package that was just published. <clears throat> so let's just run the status build. Um, when, I evoke, when I invoke the job in Jenkins, I, I get asked for package and recipient. I just need to fill them both. And then the Jenkins, uh, the, the status job will run. And after that, uh, our status repo is current. And I've been able to, to use that package. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, I've shown this to a lot of people, and I know that a lot of people use like cron jobs or so to re-index status like every minute or, or every couple of minutes. I love this situation much better because it really just happens on demand. So you don't need to re-index a, a repository that did not change, right? That doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> so that's really cool. And all you need to do is like copy that text in, in, on, this blue background, on this black background in your composer.json file, and you're able to use the status instance and just grab the packages from there, uh, which is quite easy. If you've done so, uh, you can simply say composer require custom name project one, and it will download all that stuff, and you're good to go. And I'm probably way too fast because I have no timer. Um, and that's probably it. So these are all the, the plugins that I mentioned. So there's no need to write them down. I should have mentioned that earlier. I'm sorry. Um, I will publish the slides later on. Uh, you just can easily click the links and figure out what's, what's uh, behind all that. Um, so that's basically from my side. OK, cool. So that's it from my side. Um, have fun at the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.